Welcome to Instrumental Analysis. I'm Vicki Colvin. We are finishing up a week of liquid chromatography. And this lecture, I'm talking about detectors. So the end game in any chromatography system is the detector. And in liquid chromatography, it's really challenging. You've got nanogram to picograms of material, but unlike gas chromatography, it's in the background of a solvent, a mobile phase that exists at billions of times more <laughs> atoms in concentration than the analyte you're trying to detect. So you kind of have a background problem with it. And there's a series of uh, sort of detectors that you can use. They're probably a lot less diverse than what you see in gas chromatography. But generally speaking, they're pretty robust. And you can do a lot with, for example, UV absorbance these days. So I'm going to take you through some examples and, in particular, talk about absorbance, because that's what you're going to see in most of the methods you read. So here's an overview of LC detectors, all the ones that you can buy. You'll notice in your reading, you'll see examples of fluorescence detectors. Those can be extremely sensitive, so you'll notice fluorescence can get you down to femtogram levels if you're lucky enough to have an analyte that has a good fluorescence uh, yield. Absorbance is kind of on the picogram scale. Refractive index, one that I'll be touching on today, is at the nanogram level, so pretty functionally different detection limits. And in fact, mass spectrometry, one of the big advances over the last decade, has really been the explosion of liquid chromatography coupled with mass spectrometry, which is actually a really big challenge if you think about it, because you're spraying liquids into this you know, pumped down mass spec system. But in any case, people have figured out how to do that, and that's absolutely vital for proteomics research. In any case, this is kind of a summary of all the ones people have used. But really, the go-to common methods are going to be absorbance and refractive index. And that's what you're going to see in a lot of commercial grade um, liquid chromatography systems. Let's talk a little bit about ultraviolet absorption. We'll talk more about this next week. But to just review the basics, what you're looking at is an absorption spectrum. So we're taking in light. So this is hearkening back to atomic spectroscopy, where we have light. We've split it into multiple wavelengths. This is going to be in the ultraviolet visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And it's interacting with molecules this time, not with atoms. So you don't get sharp lines. And these molecules are going to be absorbing energy from the light, and they're going to be promoting electrons from one state to another, kind of like the atoms were jumping between their electronic configurations. Here it's going to be a similar thing, except now we're dealing with molecular orbitals, not atomic orbitals. The frequency or the wavelength of the light that gets absorbed very much kind of depends on the chromophores that are present in a molecule. So for example, in caffeine, a chromophore would be this carbonyl peak because it has pi bonding. And the pi to pi star transition is a very strong one and is often one of the ones that defines the cutoff or the max absorption of the UV. Um, you also can have pi to pi star transitions for phenyl rings. And so in each of these cases, you might have a different kind of chromophore that's giving rise to the absorption. So in beta carotene, for example, it actually is visibly absorptive. So at 400 and 500 nanometers, right in the span of visible light, it's strongly absorbing, which makes sense because we can see carrots, they're orange. Uh, caffeine, aspirin, acetone, to our eye, these look like clear materials, if they're, certainly if they're dissolved or they're in a solvent. And, but if you could have UV sight, you would notice they would have a color or they would look black because they're absorbing in the ultraviolet. And that's what these peaks tell us. They tell us at 300, and three, 300 nanometers, caffeine is not absorbing light. So if you put that color light through caffeine and you measured how much was there, you would have 100% of the photons. But as you go more and more to the UV, you see an absorption peak. And in fact, 270 would be something called the lambda max of this molecule, or the peak maximum wavelength of absorbance. And in beta carotene, that lambda max would be 450. In aspirin, looks like it'd be about 275. This acetone, also 275. That's not surprising, because they both have those carbonyl functionalities. In any case, that gives you a sense of how to think about it. So when you're looking at a molecule, and you're trying to figure out where is it going to absorb light, you sort of look at the chemistry of it, and you break it down into the organic functional groups, because those usually give you a sense of what you might see. So here are some tables that are drawn from your reading, where you can just see the lambda max. E max is how strong of a chromophore they are. So chromophore, like a conjugated alkene, at 21,000 E max means that you're going to have a lot of absorbance, even if you just have a little bit of stuff. 
And that's going to be a really important component in thinking these things through. So high Emaxes are usually preferred, and that's what you're going to want to see for really efficient detection of what's coming off of a column. One of the other things you might notice is in order to get a really good absorption, what would you do with an alkane? Nothing here really says that an alkane is going to do very much. And in point of fact, they don't. <laughs> They're very hard to detect with ultraviolet absorbance. And the same is actually true of carbohydrates or of sugars. They're very difficult to detect. And so one of the challenges is that UV absorbance is extremely powerful when you have conjugated species, double bonds, carbonyls, heteroatoms but it really runs out of steam for some really important classes of molecules. Before I talk about alternative detection methodologies, let me just talk about a really common detector that you would use for UV absorbance. So if you didn't have a lot of money, what you would do is you would only measure a single wavelength. You would have a, a sort of sample system that would look something like this, UV source going to a detector. You would have to use quartz windows because glass absorbs um, 300 nanometers, 310 nanometers and below. But in any case, in the most modern systems that you can buy in HPLC these days, they don't just let you look at 170 nanometers and get a single number or 200 nanometers and get a single number. Let me take you back to the absorbances. So for example, if you didn't have a lot of money and you were doing UV absorption on caffeine and you were trying to detect it, your cheap spectrometer would let you window only 270, like a little portion of the spectrum and say, okay, how much absorbance do I have there? And that can be useful and you can do a lot with that, but what you really want to do is what these, they're called photodiode arrays allow you to do. The way this happens is you bring a light source and you basically break it through a prism into a lot of different colors. And you simultaneously measure using a CCD camera the absorbance of your system over all wavelengths. And what that does for you is very special because rather than just getting a single peak a single nanometer number, you actually can window your spectrum and get the entire ultraviolet visible spectrum. So let's look at this example of a chromatogram. And what's happening here is this is the top spectrum, this is time, and this is signal. And you can see a bunch of stuff coming off of a column. With a UV detector, and, and the signal here is probably the integrated UV absorbance over some range. With a UV photodiode array, you can window and say, I want to see not just how much light was absorbed over, let's say, 200 to 400 nanometers. I actually want to see the spectrum that tells me which wavelengths were absorbed more than others. It's kind of the fingerprint of the molecule. And so down here, what you're looking at is actually the UV vis absorbance of that molecule. And what's really nice is there are databases now where you can go and look up and it tries to say, okay, for that UV absorbance, it must be this molecule. And in this case, it was able to match it. This is a study with isoflavones. This is up on the website and you can take a look at it just for, for information. And you're able to actually, without having to run it through a mass spec, get a pretty high confidence of what type of isoflavone you have. This isn't going to work for all separations and all analytes, but it's remarkably general for a lot of the ones that folks are interested in. So when you read a chromatography method that's LC and you look at the detector, sometimes it will just say lambda equal 190, which means you simply measured the absorbance at 190 and that was your y-axis. Or sometimes it says a UV photodiode array, and then it might give a, way, a range of wavelengths that it integrated over in order to create the Y signal. So it's a very powerful thing, and it's sometimes called a PDA, UV PDA, but um, diode arrays are great to have, and they really can help you not just sort of know how much of something you have, but as in this case, identify what kind of molecule you have based on its ultraviolet visible fingerprint. Now, what do you do with those molecules that don't have a chromophore, like alkanes, some carbohydrates? That's much tougher. And you have to use something called a refractive index detector. In an RI detector, the good news is they're simpler than a photodiode array. They simply measure, this, you're putting an interface up against a prism, and depending on the refractive index of the fluid above, more or less light leaks out. You detect how much leaks out, you back calculate to the refractive index, and you can figure out how much organic stuff must have been in the solvent. It's great because you don't need much volume for analysis, but you need really good thermal control in the detector. And you really need to have the mobile phase really being able to give you a signal different, in this case, actually from the analyte, not from the eluent. So RI detection is less sensitive. You give up at least 
a factor of 10, sometimes 100 when you use this, but it's great and kind of the only game in town for some really, really important analytes. Now, the last example I'll just mention is the possibility that's now a real reality for many labs, which is the ability to hook up your LC and the little bit of solvent that comes out at the end into a mass spectrometer. So you do LC and then you do mass spec. That is enormously more difficult than doing GCMS. And the reason is that, remember, mass specs are separating ions. They have to be at low pressures. There is nothing low pressure about a liquid. It's a very dense volume of stuff. And if you take a liquid and you put it into a vacuum, right, it's going to spray everywhere. It's going to raise the pressure. It's going to be a mess. So you need a really amazing differential pumping, way more than you need for ICPMS or even GCMS. So you can do it. Here's an example of a system shown over here. So that tall thing on the left is a pretty classic liquid chromatography system. And then the thing that's long on the, on the um, counter is actually a mass spectrometer. There's a lot of different ways of designing it. Sometimes you do a quadrupole. Sometimes you do a cheaper version of a mass spec. But it really works great, particularly for peptides. So one of the really growing areas in analysis, particularly in biology, has been the identification of proteins in a lot of different kinds of samples through the application of liquid chromatography mass spec, or LCMS. And LCMS is the go-to technique for a lot of proteomics if you're trying to profile, for example, the proteins that are in the blood of somebody who has a certain kind of cancer and compare it to somebody who's healthy. LCMS can give you that kind of information. And so these kinds of tools, which traditionally were really used for small organic molecules, are becoming more and more important in medicine and biology. And I would say that LCMS is kind of one of the examples where advances in the analytical technology of linking the liquid chromatography to the mass spec really made that possible. So it's a very exciting area. So it's a very, very exciting area. Anyhow, that's it for detectors. I gave you three examples. UV-Vis, Refractive Index, and Mass Spec. We'll talk a little bit more about fluorescence as well next week. But as you can see, you can put a lot of different detectors on, but at the end of the day, the UV-Vis is really going to be probably 80% of the more common examples that you see. Thanks so much. See you next time.